Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, June 12, 2022. We are in our second lesson of Unit 1 for the summer quarter. Lesson 2, Unit 1 is entitled, God Delivers and Restores. God Delivers and Restores, and our lesson title from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly Commentary is a Mission to Save, a Mission to Save. Devotional reading for our lessons taken from Psalm 130, background scripture, Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 17, and our printed or lesson passage is Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 13. This is Deacon Barry Taylor. Our key verse is verse 8, Isaiah 49, verse 8, and from the NIV it reads, This is what the Lord says, In the time of my favor I will answer you, and in the day of salvation I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land to reassign the desolate inheritances. Again, that's Isaiah 49, 8. From the quarterly, the lesson aims or number one, understand that God's mission for the people of Israel is to show all people the way to God. Number two, celebrate that all people who serve God are included in his promises. And number three, tell others about God's never-ending love and salvation for all the people. After the introduction, our lesson has three major divisions. The first is entitled, The Servant's Ministry. And that's covered between Isaiah 49 verses 1 to 6. Second is entitled Confirmation of the Servant's Ministry. That's covered between verses 7 and 9b. And the third is entitled Restoration Accomplished. That's covered between Isaiah 49, 9c and verse 13. From the Standard Commentary, our lesson title is God Foretells Redemption. Redemption means to buy back or to recover. Additional aims or number one, identify the servant. Number two, describe the function of the test or text rather as part of Isaiah's servant's songs. And number three, identify one way to be a better servant of the servant. Let us go before the throne, eternal God, our Father. We do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. Lord, we thank you that you sent your faithful servant, Lord, to accomplish your will in reconciling sinful man to you, Lord, for sacrificing his life, Lord, on a cross, Lord, for shedding his precious blood to pay the penalty for our sins, Lord. Lord, to give us spiritual and physical restoration, Lord. We thank you for all that he's done, what your spirit is yet doing in us and through us, and Lord, all that you've promised to do. We thank you for, again, this opportunity. We pray that you would open up our understanding, help us to understand uh, clearly, Lord, uh, what you intend for us to understand in the, in the passage today, Lord. And Lord, as we understand your lesson, please increase our faith. And as our faith is increased, increase our obedience, Lord, to continue the mission, Lord, that your son Jesus started. And that is to, to spread the gospel, the good news, Lord, that men can be saved because of his sacrifice on the cross. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, I'm going to give a little background, a little context for our lesson. We are in the second half of the book of Isaiah. Some of you um, 
uh, or very, who are familiar with uh, the book of Isaiah know that there are two distinct halves. This uh, second half is between verses, I'm sorry, chapters 40 and 66. And while the first half consisted mostly of judgments and uh, warnings, and uh, the second half uh, speaks more of God's restoration of Israel and, of course, all peoples uh, on the earth. Um, now, in this second half, there are four poems or songs which are entitled Servants' Songs. Servants' Songs. Our lesson text is taken from the second of the four servant songs uh, Isaiah which is uh, Isaiah 49 verses 1 to 7 the first song is covered between Isaiah 42 verses 1 to 9 the second again Isaiah 49 1 to 7 the third Isaiah 50 verses 4 to 9 and also some some uh, include through verse 11 50 11 and then the fourth is Isaiah 52 verses 13 through chapter 53 and verse 12 and not to belabor uh, the point but those songs uh, can be titled very briefly the first again 40 verse chapter 42 verses 1 to 9 judgment to the Gentiles the second, which is where our lesson text is taken from, chapter 49, verses 1 to 7. The light to the Gentiles. The third, chapter four, uh, 50, verses 4 to 9. The Lord's promised help. And then the fourth, verses, uh, chapter 52, verse 13 to 53, 12. The coming Messiah. And, and some add yet a fifth song, which is covered between chapters 61, verses 1 to 4, and that is entitled, The Savior's Promised Renewal. The Savior's Promised Renewal. Now, some of you may know that uh, the Lord uh, also calls uh, Israel his servant uh, in the Bible. And actually, he called the nation Israel. Uh, first, uh, Abraham, and through his seed, the nation Israel, he intended for them to, to be priests, uh, to, be, uh, to actually uh, evangelize the world, to let the world know of him his laws, his ordinances. Uh, however, Israel fail uh, miserably uh, through their idolatry and other sins. And uh, you may, some of you may know of uh, Israel being compared to a vine uh, in Isaiah chapter five, and then Christ in the New Testament in John chapter fifteen is called the true vine. We know that the vine that Israel was was one that produce sour grapes and even though the Lord had dunged around it and pruned it and tried to get good grapes off of it it produced sour grapes so the true vine is the Lord Jesus Christ some have called him the true Israel but we're not going to introduce that confusion in our lesson today but we are going to uh, start with the first passage from the uh, quarterly again and then we're going to back up and go verse by verse. So um, the first passage again, in the first division of the quarterly is entitled The Servant's Ministry. Again, the servant is the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and I'm going to stick with the NIV uh, today for greater clarity. And it reads, this is covered between uh, chapter 49 verses 1 to 6 listen to me you islands hear this you destined land before I was born the Lord called me from my mother's womb and he has spoken my name 
He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. Verse 3. He said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. Verse 5. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel himself, for I am honored in his eyes, in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. And finally, verse 6, he says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles and my salvation, <clears throat> that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. That is verses 1 to 6 from chapter 49. So let's back up and, uh, as is my custom, um, do some verse-by-verse -verse, uh, expository teaching. So let's look at verse 1a, which says, Listen, and I'm... Yeah, it says, Listen to me, you islands. It says, Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord all caps l-o-r-d which is jehovah the self-existent one this is god the father call me from my mother's womb he has spoken my name so what is uh what's that all about okay the lord god called him as a servant from his mother's womb what does that suggest that he was human and as i said before while israel has been referred to as a servant of the Lord. Uh, this is talking about an individual human. Uh, the fact that he was called from a womb, yet virgin born, suggests that he was, uh, well, actually, it proves that he was human. Now, and the declaration is to the nations, is to the world, the islands. Uh, he is, when, when, uh, proclamations are made to the islands and he said he's in distant nations he is talking about the entire world all of humanity uh, this announcement is being made to and he is drawing attention to again uh, all humans so the world is called to recognize two significant points number one the messiah or servant will be a human being as i said born as are others of a woman yet virgin born and then number two he will be an individual as distinct from a personified group such as the nation israel which is as i said has also been called the lord's servant and there are many scriptures to support that so god has has planned the mission for him this is uh, he has been called uh, as a culmination of careful planning, and the intention of God is, is going to be clear uh, as he pronounces the mission for his servant. So we're going to see as we go through here that the servant himself speaks between verses 1 and 5. This is the Lord Jesus speaking, or the Messiah speaking. And then beginning in verse 6, God is going to speak. Verse 2a, And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. Now for those of you who study the Bible, you know a sharp sword in a prophet's mouth uh, likely refers to the word God calls his servant to speak prophetically. Uh, and it imbues these words with authority. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. So the words are powerful. We know that the Lord Jesus' uh, mouth uh, in Revelation is being um, 
symbolized as a two-edged sword, which means it cuts going and coming. It's the truth of God. And while the words uh, bring peace, uh, when accepted, uh, they also bring judgment uh, to the unrighteous or when they are ignored. Verse 2b, in the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft or arrow in his quiver hath he hid me. Uh, deviated a little bit from the NIV there, but he is saying he has hidden this sharp sword in his hand. I'm sorry, he has hidden the servant in his hand or elsewhere wing is referred to as wing is one way to speak of the safety of being in God's care. Uh, we can look at Psalms 63 verse 7, Psalm 91 verse 1. And, and others. And this polished shaft or arrow, this reference to a polished shaft or arrow, well, uh, the more polished an arrow is, the shaft of an arrow is, the truer it flies. So he is going to direct uh, the servant directly to the target. And the target, of course, is sinful man. Obviously, it's sinful Israel, but also sinful humanity across the world. And the fact that it is polished suggests that it will fly true and, and perfectly accomplish his work or the mission that God sends him on. The sword again implies a judgment. It implies uh, judgment to those who do not accept the words that the servant speaks. Verse 3, he said to me, you are my servant. Israel in whom I will display splendor. Now he refers to his servant as Israel here and there are um, more than a few explanations as to why he does that. Uh, MacArthur says, John MacArthur says that the Lord uses the name Israel, use of the name Israel refers here to Messiah uh, is explainable through the intimate relationship that exists between the nation and her king. So he is actually a representative of Israel in a sense. Uh, there are other uh, explanations from the standard commentary. One of the explanations is that Jesus is the true Israel. Remember I mentioned that Jesus was the true vine spoken of in John or described in John and he he implores us to abide in him and produce much fruit so he is the true vine or the true Israel the true servant if you will of God uh, Israel turned out to be again a very uh, faithless uh, servant that did not accomplish the mission God intended for them now he says he is going to be glorified in him. The servant is saying that God is going to be glorified in him. And we know that Jesus did glorify the Father when he did everything, first of all, that he sent him to do. He spoke the words that he, uh, he had him to speak while he was here on earth during his earthly ministry. And certainly he went to the cross in obedience, even to the death of the cross on the cross. So he was glorified, he glorified the father in being perfectly obedient to the Lord. Look at the second chapter of uh, Philippians verse four. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand. And my reward is with my God. Now, why would the Lord say that his labor was in vain? Well, at his first coming, his first advent, uh, he met with rejection. Uh, we look at uh, the first chapter of John when it says he came unto his own and his own received him not. Uh, he, he was met with rejection by his nation. 
uh, it uh, might have appeared that uh, some of his mission was a failure because of the suffering and rejection he endured and then of course up ultimately the death on the cross however we know that uh, God rewarded him and he knew that God was going to reward him uh, for his obedience even to the death of the cross wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue shall confess because of his obedience to the Father in accomplishing his mission and that is to ensure or provide for to make the necessary sacrifice to pay the sin debt of the world so he when he says um, in the Lord's hand and my reward is with him that is what he is talking about he glorified the father through this death on the cross and the father glorified him verse 5 and now the Lord says he who formed me in the womb again speaking of his humanity to be his servant to bring Jacob another name for Israel back to him and gather Israel to himself for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord my God has been my strength so the servants mission will include the priority of bringing Israel to the Lord uh, and we can see references to this uh, mission in uh, Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6, uh, chapter 15, verse 24. Romans uh, 1 and 16 is a familiar verse, and it reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, or that leads to salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So his mission was to bring first the household of Israel to God, to faith in God and belief in him and his sacrificial death for their sins and then of course to the rest of the world now we know that he during his first advent he did not bring all Israel back to faith in the Lord he will accomplish that in his second advent when he returns he will accomplish what uh, this part of his mission, uh, we can look at, um, again, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10, 10 and then uh, through uh, chapter 13, verse 1, uh, for more information on that part of his mission. Just, just to read a portion of that passage from Zechariah, uh, verse, chapter 12, verse 10, and it begins... And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of had a drama in the valley of Megiddo and it goes on to say that uh, that they are going to again be be saved if you read throughout that passage that's when the nation is going to be saved by the way in in verse 5 when when it says uh, and now the Lord says he who formed me in the womb that's a repetition of verse uh, 3 uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 1 rather, verse 1 where he, he calls him from his mother's womb. And whenever you see a repetition of something, it's for greater emphasis and it's emphasizing his humanity. Uh, and, and we need to recognize that Jesus, uh, as difficult as it is to understand, was fully man, but also uh, fully uh, God, a second person of the Trinity, of the Godhead. And it speaks of... He says, for I am honored, second part of that verse, in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. So he is going to accomplish 
what he does in the strength of the Lord. He has taken on humanity uh, and he is relying on God to accomplish his will through him. And he is obedient, as I said, in performing everything and accomplishing perfectly uh, the will of God while he is incarnate. Verse 6, he says, it, 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 it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back the house of Israel. And I will add parenthetically, only, he said, bring back the, the, he says, bring back the, those of Israel I have kept. He's kept the 10 lost tribes or whatever remnant of the lost tribes they are as well as the two southern tribes uh, principally judah and he says he will bring them back he's kept them he will bring them back and he says i will also make you a light for the gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth now he's not suggesting that what jesus is going to do is a small task but he is he is saying i'm not only going to do this to you and again we know that there's no great task for the lord but what the lord jesus endured in his humanity was tremendous was the greatest gift that anyone could give uh he says he is going to not only do this for the house of israel but he's going to make him a light. A light is something that dispels darkness. It is truth. It is it's a symbol of truth for the Gentiles that my salvation, my deliverance may reach to the ends of the earth. And that is what he promised to do through Abraham's seed. He promised Abraham's that through, through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed and they have been blessed through the sacrificial death of jesus christ for their sin and the forgiveness and the reconciliation to god that jesus has provided for the for the world during paul's first missionary journey we see this in acts chapter 1 verse 47 he pronounces this part of the servant's mission he says for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light for the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Now, before we end the lesson, we're going to talk about how this applies to us. We are reading uh, a poetry or reading a song, uh, that an inspired song that speaks of the servant and his mission. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, when we before we wrap up what this means to us, what what we are to take away from uh, this song, from this lesson. So we're going to move into the second division of the quarterly, which is entitled "Confirmation of the Servant's Ministry." Confirmation of the Servant's Ministry, and that's covered between chapter 49 verses 7 to 9b and it reads again from the NIV this is what the Lord says the Redeemer the Holy One of Israel to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation to the servant of rulers kings will see you and stand up princes will see and bow down because the Lord who is faithful the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Verse 8, this is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people. To restore the land and to reassign the desolate inheritances. And then 9b reads, To say to the captives, Come out, and to those in darkness, be free. Now first we can say that the success of the servant's mission is guaranteed by God's promise to uphold him. Although despised and rejected by his people, 
the Lord will exalt him before kings and princes. With the Lord's support, the servant will fulfill God's covenant promises to Israel. Restoration, possession, liberation, and transformation, the commentator speaks here, will be accomplished through this servant. It goes on to say that Israel will experience a literal nationalistic recovery, physically possess the land of promise, be freed from oppression, and become the people whom God originally intended. So backing up to verse 7 again, it reads, This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, that's God speaking of himself, to him who was despised, that's him speaking of the Messiah servant, and abhorred by the nations, to the servant of rulers, he's saying, colon, kings will see you and stand up, stand up in honor. Princes will see you and bow down in honor, in reverence, because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, again speaking of God the Father, who has chosen you. He is the chosen of God. And Messiah means the anointed of God. And um, so he is, this, we know during his first advent, he suffered humiliating treatment. Uh, he, uh, again, was, uh, was, was just really uh, disrespected and rejected by his own people and certainly uh, the Romans uh, or Gentiles of that day. And the rulers and the kings are speaking uh, specifically about the Gentiles. And, and, and eventually he is going to be exalted by the Gentiles, by rulers, by kings, by princes, uh, during his second advent. And we know that uh, because of uh, the work that he did with those uh, who did believe on him and through them and the disciples who became apostles who continued his work afterwards, the church was birthed and the church has had uh, really kind of taken on the mantle of uh, what Israel was called to do, the church has continued the work of Christ as his servant. Uh, we are the servant of the servant, but we're continuing the mission of God, and that is to spread the gospel, to advance the gospel uh, according to our commission that was given to us in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Now, in speaking again of his his second advent, if we look at uh, Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 15, regarding the Gentile and the princes and the kings, it says, So shall he sprinkle many nations, the kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard they Consider So they're going to see the Lord. They're going to reverence and exalt him uh, during his second advent. Verse 8. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances so what is he talking about here acceptable time uh, uh, day of salvation well first of all uh, acceptable time day of salvation or parallel terms and that's that's used for emphasis and uh, and, and they both denote a time when God would hear his people and act against again on their behalf now, in the short term, this this could be seen in the in the his people's return from captivity in Babylon, uh, but in the longer term, it is fulfilled uh, in Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul quotes in Second uh, Corinthians uh, chapter two and verse. I'm sorry, chapter six. Chapter 6 and verse 2, For he saith, 
I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in a day of salvation I have succored thee, or uh, allowed thee, uh, favored thee, if you will. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So the favored time is the time when salvation is offered. The favored time now is any time since Jesus made his sacrifice for the sins of the world. Galatians 4 and 4 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Verse 5 says, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And those of us who are Bible students know that the law could not save. The law only showed us our sin, but it could not save or deliver us from our sin. It took the blood of Jesus Christ to do that. So he says, In the day again of my favor I will answer you. In the day of salvation, I will help you. He will deliver. He will save those of us who trust in his son. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant. This is the new covenant written on the hearts and not on tablets of stone that Jeremiah talks about. And, and he said he would be our, we would be his people and he would be our God. This, we are in the new covenant with God. And this, in this covenant, is the church. Uh, the Jews had a covenant with God, but the church is made up of Jew and Gentile, and we are in a covenant with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his blood. The covenant being ratified by his blood. But he's talking specifically to Israel about restoring the land and reestablishing the, the inheritances. When, um, uh, when Joshua led uh, the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. The land was divided by tribes, and then the tribes divided the land by family, and they had inheritances that were passed on from generation to generation. That is what he's speaking of here, restoring a nation Israel to the land according to their inheritances. Verse 9, to say, this is uh, verse 9b, to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. Actually, what I read was uh, 9A, or part of 9A, It's talk, which reads, uh, and I'll just read the complete part A from the KJV. It says that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness show yourselves now um, uh, this speaks of, of, of God's deliverance it speaks of uh, him bringing, bringing uh, people out of darkness which symbolizes sin and ignorance into the light of truth or his salvation uh, if we look at uh, uh, Isaiah 9 2 uh, where he speaks about the uh, uh, we know this verse verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah 9 can uh, speak to the Gentiles as well as uh, uh, Israelites this verse 2 says the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shined so this is this can be uh, understood to uh, to speak of God's uh, being the, the light and the truth of the gospel to those who are in sin and ignorance. Again, that part, part of the verse speaks of his deliverance. And part B says, they shall feed in the ways and their pastures shall be in the high places. Now, it's just talking again about, this is talking about God's provision for uh, his people that he is again in the short term uh, returning from Babylon long term he is going to restore Israel to the land uh, typically the lusher pasture lands were in the valleys in the low areas uh, on the the tops of the high places uh, were were not uh, good 
grazing uh, area. In fact, uh, idolatrous practices were performed in high places, but uh, God is saying he is going to make those places a fertile and, and, and good pasture lands uh, that may have been jagged and rocky and, and what have you before. So we, with that, we've kind of moved into the third division, which is entitled Restoration Accomplished, and that's covered between 9C and verse 13, and I'll just pick up at verse 10, and it says, They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads, and my highways will be raised up. See, they will come from afar, some from the north, some from the west, some from the region of Aswan. Shout for joy, verse 13, shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. Now, uh, backing up to verse 10, again it reads, They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who hath compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside the spring waters. Now, it's difficult to know whether... Um, the the reference here is to promises uh, from a spiritual point of view assuming the hunger and the thirst or metaphors for the longing for God uh, but Isaiah's uh, original audience uh, the comment one commentator says however would have looked forward to the security against scarcity especially following the exile in Babylon protection from heat uh, he talks about how God might make provision for that by having them uh, work certain hours when the sun was not only having to work certain hours when the sun was not high. And and there's some practical ways. And, and then, of course, providing springs of waters in the land. Uh, it's difficult to know the timing of this uh, if it's physical restoration uh, exactly, but I think that the, the takeaway for us is to know that uh, that Jesus is our source uh, of all of our spiritual and physical needs, all of our spiritual and physical needs. He's not a resource, he is the source. And that was demonstrated by the many miracles that Jesus did and feeding 5,000 men plus women and children, 4,000 men plus women and children, he provided, he was a source of that physical food. And in and, and, and John chapter 6, verse 35, he says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. And while he is speaking spiritually there, he will provide also for all of our physical needs. I think that's the takeaway for us concerning uh, this restoration that God is going to provide the, the pasture lands and he's going to level the, uh, the depressed highways. If we go on, uh, read uh, verse 11, it says, our return all my mountains uh, into roads, so he will make the mountains easy to traverse, and my highways will be raised. Those depressed areas uh, of the roadway will be leveled so that people can, can easily traverse them. Verse 12 says, See, they will come from afar, uh, from the north and from the west, and from obviously from the east and the region of as Swan, which is believed to be in the southeast. So they'll come from all directions. And this is speaking of uh, his second uh, advent when all will come, will be led to Jerusalem to worship uh, the Lord Jesus. 
And this period is, is kind of summarized, this period when all Israel is going to be gathered and others from around the world. There's several <clears throat> verses we could cite, but one passage is uh, Isaiah 61, verses 1 to, f 1 to 4. And this, again, might be considered uh, yet a fifth uh, song or poem, if you will. And it reads, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We know Jesus read this in the synagogue uh, before um, the Jews. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint upon them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes and oil for, of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified, and that they shall build the old wastes they shall raise up former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. So we, we are um, undoubtedly speaking about his second advent when he is, uh, these last few verses of our lesson text, when he is gathering uh, to uh, Jerusalem, and then uh, we sum up uh, his his provisions, spiritual and physical provisions, with the natural response that uh, we should all have. Uh, and verse 13, and that is said, shout, this is a command, to shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. Now, um, we have uh, a certainly greater reason to rejoice than uh, the physical comfort that the Lord uh, provides for us, the physical comfort that God promised to provide for his, his people, his covenant people, his Isra uh, the Israelites. Uh, we have salvation to rejoice in, and all that that includes it includes the indwelling of his spirit it includes everything uh, uh that our that the lord has uh that we are in that we are entitled to if we need uh, more faith we only have to ask if we need the holy spirit we only have to ask uh, uh romans 8 says that, that he that spared i believe his verse 32 that he that spared not his son but delivered us uh, for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? If if God would deliver his son to save us, what would he not give us? So we are to rejoice in our salvation. And again, all that that involves, the wisdom, if we lack wisdom, we can ask for that. Certainly for our spirit, our physical needs, any physical need, we can ask our father for that and know that uh, he will provide for all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, we what what is what are we to get out of this lesson? I mean, it it uh, it's it's a beautiful passage. Speaks of uh, God's mission for His servant. We know that to be the Messiah, uh, and this was, of course, written hundreds of years before his his first advent. Uh, we know that he uh, that his the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, accomplished his mission perfectly. But what does it mean to us? We know that because of him accomplishing his mission, his faithfulness, if we place our trust in him, uh, we we have a right to call God our Father. We have a relationship with God our Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. We have uh, eternal life from the moment we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, which means we will not, we will be delivered from the penalty of sin, the power of sin by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and his sanctifying work in us, and ultimately from the very presence of sin. We will spend eternity in his presence. But we are also to take up 
uh, the work of the servant. We are to, again, we are to advance the gospel as he commanded us to uh, when he departed this earth. So as he declared in Matthew uh, chapter 28, and I'm going to back up to verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo I am with you always even until the end of the world the Lord Jesus when we are accomplishing his mission continuing his mission he is so we trust that um, uh, we understood this lesson a little this passage a little better than we may have before and we pray that God will keep you until such time as as we meet again